A Flash game from the mid-2000s, Stinkoman 20XD6 is better known as the anime universe version of the classic Flash cartoon Homestar Runner. After 15 years of being abandoned without a conclusion, the game has finally been completed. Just in time for Flash as a format to shut down completely in a few weeks from now. On this speed pass, let's find out if it's worth jumping into the game now that it has a very real shelf life. Taking place in that Homestar Runner anime universe that was spawned when a fan asked Strong Bad what he'd look like as a Japanese cartoon character, this game was the most popular Flash game on the site during its heyday. It was releasing levels steadily throughout a few months until... nothing. The game was never finished, leaving us all on a cliffhanger after level 9 with no reason that I've been able to find as to why it was so suddenly abandoned. Fast forward to 2017, where a fan offered to finish the game for them via Twitter, an offer that was taken 100% seriously by the official Homestar Twitter, and now, here in 2020, a few weeks before Flash is destroyed forever, we have the final product. Was it worth the wait? Well, that depends on how you feel about Homestar Runner humor, and the sheer brutality of the rest of this game. Graphically, it's muddled around the look of NES graphics, and to throw the biggest glaring issue of Yahtzee's Shovel Knight review under the bus, the NES had plenty of games that supported parallax scrolling, so don't claim this game is more of an NES Plus just because this game also has it. Stinko Man, Strong Bad's 20XD6 character if you're not on board with 2000's internet scene, is obviously a Mega Man reference, and so's the game, really. However, Stinko Man's jump height is much worse than the Blue Bomber, so levels are a bit more tightly packed overall. Sprites are numerous and as wacky as you would expect, ranging from standard robots, bone-spewing chickens, saw blades stashed away in pink clouds, or airborne seafood fighter fleets. Bosses are pretty impressive at times, though, usually taking up a large sprite area and having some fun designs overall. There's plenty of references for longtime sight fans, as expected, with NES-styled cutscenes, and as of the new level update, an anime opening movie. The music in this game is fantastic, if not a bit repetitive at times for certain songs. It's all chiptune, and some loops are far, far shorter than others. As tricky as this game can be, you might be stuck listening to a song for a long while, to the point that a good song becomes okay, and a decent song becomes a grating one. It's also really, really loud! By default, the music will drown out everything else, as there is no volume adjustment beyond your speakers, so prepare accordingly. That's at odds with the game's sound effects, which in turn are far quieter, to the point my stream audience thought that there wasn't any sound in the game. In addition to the standard video gamey pew pew and damage noises, the game does have some garbled speech in parts, some lines done by the character's creators as they would be in the cartoons, and a pretty obnoxious laugh after defeating most bosses. Just like how, from an aesthetic standpoint, the game takes a lot of inspiration from Mega Man games, that goes almost exactly for its gameplay. Though, there is no boss selection screen, as it's more story and level based, a la Ninja Gaiden, and trust me, that influences there as well. But most notably about NES Mega Man and NES Ninja Gaiden, this game is unforgivingly brutal, especially when it first came out. Four hit points, three lives, and death upon falling into pits was already pretty absurd, but when you combine that with classic NES hard gameplay of off-screen surprise attacks, the occasional leap of faith, jumps you have to pretty much reach the edge of the platform in order to barely make, occasionally being guarded by a flying or shooting enemy that's waiting to knock you back down, you can see that frustration is everywhere. The game would be borderline impossible if it wasn't for the fact that you could select any level once you've reached it. Luckily, they seem to notice this, as the new update adds New Mode, which grants you 6 hit points instead of 4, 5 lives instead of 3, and adds mid-level checkpoints. Also, falling is no longer an instant death, instead just doing a point of damage after you respawn on the ledge. The second half of level 3 has also been tweaked to be far more tolerable in how it plays. 
That might be considered a sacrilege to some NES hard purists, but it's far more approachable. This game can feel pretty jank and it makes for plenty of cheap death, regardless of what mode you're playing on. I highly suggest playing through in new mode if you haven't played this before, and you can try hard all you want in classic later. I advise you to play it with a joy to key or any other method of mapping keyboard controls to a controller as well. Arrows and A and S keys works on the keyboard, and I did manage to complete every available level back in the day using the keyboard in the original difficulty, but it's painfully tricky if you are used to a gamepad. Story is as much about the meta and nonsense humor that Homestar is known for, and not only referencing itself, but video games, anime, and bad translations all around. As the cutscenes don't shy away from broken and dodgy English, as well as purposeful typos, each level boldly exclaims start play in text when you begin, keep try when you die, and a game over screen will have Stinko Man complain my stummy hurts before getting kicked out of the title screen. Stinko Man being the 20xd6 version of Strong Bad, he's filled with that same arrogance that you'd expect from Strong Bad, always talking smack despite being usually pretty lazy, unless someone challenges him to a fight, or he perceives that someone did. The game even starts out with a cutscene where he destroys a giant brain-powered robot, and you begin the game with the ever-noble goal of going home. Since we may not see this game in the future, depending on how fast people are working on preserving it, or whether or not there's a port or remaster in the works, let's do what I did for the Spinch review and just go over every level. It should be far shorter this time, and I promise I'm not just shooting for the 10 minute mark. You can also consider this a spoiler if you're still able to play this and want to see the rest of it. With level 1's concept of just going home, it does serve as an intro level, despite you having to make some of the trickier jumps in the game. You'll learn very fast how much this game hates you. Just move and jump between platforms while firing shots at everything you see. Some enemies have pretty tricky weak points that won't be that easy to hit, as your punches shockwaves don't fire straight all the time and they do have a bit of a drop off. There isn't really any fundamental differences between 1-1 and 1-2. The boss is the brain from that robot Stinko Man destroyed in the cutscene, grown to five times its size. It is a fairly exploitable pattern that just gets faster each time you damage it. Stage 2 starts after 1-Up, the 20xd6 version of Homestar Runner, informs Stinko Man that their friend Pan Pan has been kidnapped. Except that Stinko Man doesn't really care about that, as he nearly choked on a chicken bone, and swears revenge against the chicken that did this to him. You spend the entirety of World 2 in a giant kitchen, fighting off yellow chickens, while avoiding electric and gas burners. Stage 2 1 ends by making a leap of faith that completes the second you're about to fall into a floor of spikes. Stage 2 2 is a pretty annoying section where you have to choose to fall into one of three drop tunnels, immediately followed by a section of dripping acid bottles, and a bone spitting chicken that seems impossible not to take damage from. The last chicken does drop a health pill, and it takes place right before the boss. The boss is a massive chicken that spends most of its time trying to stomp you with its legs, until eventually it'll drop its head down for a quick peck. That's your only opportunity to hit it, and you'll know if you did hit it, if you see its head flash red, or the legs that return as it pulls its head back. Level 3 starts with Stinko Man being unable to clear a low wall with his pathetic jump height, so he vastly overcompensates in frustration by rocketing himself into the sky. This level is very weird as it's the first time the game stops playing like a Mega Man game and goes more into minigame territory. You'll spend your ascent punching raindrops and avoiding damaging clouds in order to collect 20 coins, for reasons. Once that happens, you'll descend by having to collect 10 pieces of toast, among a litany of other falling objects, like apples, bars of soap, human ears, or the capital letter P. If you collect toast, your counter goes up, but any other object will make it go down by one. You can't die in this section either, but unless you're playing a new mode where the toast is far more plentiful and the other objects have been lessened, you could feel trapped here for far longer than you would expect. The boss is that wall you just leapt over, attached to a massive robot with slamming stone fists. That small bit of wall is the weak point, and it shrinks down as you damage it. Destroy it, and Stinko Man takes one of the stone fists for himself to attach to his arm. Level 4 is another level that changes up the gameplay style. Since Stinko Man refuses to help rescue Pan Pan, 1UP runs off to do it by himself, taking Stinko Man's power crunch a cassette tape, don't ask, and taking a shortcut through the lava zone. So Stinko Man runs off to rescue his power crunch. Armed with the giant stone fist, you escort one up through the lava zone. Use the fist to block falls of lava and cause rocks to tumble onto enemies below. You can also jump on colored buttons to move platforms for one up to safely cross. This is probably one of the hardest levels in the game as one up will move slowly and gleefully march towards his death. If he takes any damage, 
He'll die, and then you die and have to start over. It's easy to get complacent and take a death because you have to replay so many times. Not to mention, 1UP will be targeted by surprise cheap shots on occasion, and some of the timing for the platforms and blocking lava falls is extremely tight. The boss is also very frustrating, as it's a lava worm that jumps out from below firing lasers. The last section of its tail is always the weak spot, and you have to remove each section all the way up to its head. Each tail section you remove slows the amount of lasers that get fired, but it also makes it jump higher each time. To make matters worse, jets of flame will shoot out from the ceiling at regular intervals, targeting you always wherever you're standing, so you have to be on the move constantly, which can easily force you into a spot that you'll be forced to take damage. I hate this thing. After Stinkoman breaks his stone fist on the boss of level 4, 1UP still insists on rescuing Pan Pan. With Stinkoman absolutely refusing to help this time, 1UP heads off to level 5 on his own, which is apparently the moon. With no arms, 1UP can only kick, but he can jump higher than Stinkoman and Hurricane Kick when attacking in midair. The gameplay is pretty much the same as a standard stage, but all your attacks are melee. The shield enemies and meteorites are the most annoying enemies to deal with here. The boss is Nebulon, a giant green alien whose weak point is his massive eye stalks. He fires out shots randomly, and blows 1UP back with his breath any time that an eye stalk takes damage. If you take out both eye stalks, you'll win, only for 1UP to get kidnapped. Stinkoman decides to take a vacation after complaining how hard the game that he's playing was. This'll start level 6, Pink Cloud Zone. Nothing super special goes on here, as it's mostly platforming challenges, with some disintegrating clouds and a lot of electric-themed enemies, like an invincible floating plug, thunder clouds, and bolt-firing outlets. There's also plenty of traps like drills and saw blades that are concealed in the clouds. You can take a few alternate paths here to reach places in differing ways, like if you prefer platforming to combat. The boss is a tornado wearing sunglasses. It has a pretty simple pattern of bouncing over to one side of the screen, lobbing water droplets at you while it tries to draw you in, and only occasionally stopping in the center to drop lightning from the sky. Defeat it to reveal that it was a fat mouse, and move on to the next level, after the mysterious silhouette teleports you to level 7. Level 7 is an ice level, because just like blue hair, you gotta have an ice level. NES ice physics abound, the platforming here is pretty annoying, and some enemies can freeze you in place. You'll also have to shatter or avoid shattering ice blocks in order to proceed with a stage or perform platforming shortcuts. This boss is likely the easiest one in the game. Climb the ladder to shoot its eyes. When its eyes shut, it blasts the platform with cold air and spits out ice cubes. Once they're opened back up, it'll lob icicles from the sky. These icicles are stupidly easy to avoid, as all you need to do is be on or above the ladder, and they will never hit you. Vowing revenge on whoever teleported him to the ice world, Stinkoman gets teleported again, but this time inside of a wall. As he blasts the wall away and walks past the game's borders, he ends up in the negative zone, level 8, or level negative 0, resembling a glitching NES cartridge. It's a complete mess of a level, with sprites swamped everywhere, false platforms, the background scrolling in the wrong direction, and plenty of other headache-inducing situations. Even the stage music is a remix of all the previous stage themes weirdly smashed together. Oddly, it's not all that bad to get through the level, though Stage 8-2 does have a small teleporter maze that might confuse you even more. The boss is an amalgamation of stage assets. You shoot its refrigerator body once the door is open, then use the teleporter on the side of the arena to warp up to the top, cross over safely, and jump back down to repeat. Destroying it reveals the location of 1UP and Pan Pan, who Stinkoman falsely accuses of teleporting him with that red button. He heads off to stage 9, but looking over the vast jungle stage ahead of him, in a very Ninja Gaiden looking cutscene, he decides to fly over it instead. So, level 9 is a side-scrolling shooter, a la Gradius. The attack button shoots your ship's lasers, while pressing jump activates a limited time shield that you have a small number of, but you can collect more of these in the stage. The stage is crawling with flying sea creatures, and there's plenty of troll moments where you'll fly towards a cluster of power-ups, and then the screen will forcefully scroll away from them. There's also a section where you need to have the shield power-up to fly through solid sections of wall. So with a stage full of seafood creatures, naturally the boss is going to be a flying mafia boss with a tommy gun. This is a pretty stupid but very hilarious in-joke in which the manual describes an octopus boss, while the mobster in the images has the quote, that description is all wrong. To make matters more meta, the end credits that showcase the absurd names of all the enemies show that octopus boss in the place of the one you actually fought. This mobster isn't super hard to fight, and plays more or less like Kabula from the Kirby games. 
a few random sprays of shots followed by a charge. The only difference is that you can only damage him by shooting him in his head while his mouth is open. The boss taken down, a ton of prawns spill out for Stinkoman to feast on as he arrives at the entrance of the castle and feels asleep. This is where the game acknowledges the 15 year gap between stage 9 and 10, as the mysterious figure remarks if Stinkoman is ever going to go inside, while 1UP grew a beard and Pan Pan had a bunch of children. Tired of Stinkoman's procrastination, the silhouette drops him through a trap door to fight a weird tank made of cotton candy, eyeballs, and whatever that is. It dies ridiculously fast when the shadowy figure emerges and Stinkoman gives chase to finally enter stage 10. The stage is crawling with skull-themed enemies and decor, consisting mostly of climbing the tower and featuring a very hype version of the stage 1 theme as a backing track. Some new types of platforms appear, like gray skulls that crack the more you jump on them, and floating platforms with lights that'll count down until the platform disappears. In what almost seems like a tribute to the game as a whole, the entirety of Stage 10 2 pays homage to the levels that came before it, featuring the decor of nearly every stage you've already played. Both stages are pretty long overall, and you'll get harassed by the silhouette as you near the end of the section. Finally reaching the boss, the mysterious figure reveals himself as the 20xd6 version of Coach Z, named Z Saber. Taking out Stinko Man pretty easily, 1UP tosses Stinko Man his power crunch, powering him up to his muscle form so you can begin the duel. Stinko Man's new form doesn't really do much more than make him larger and give him a much higher jump. Z Saber can't be hit until he's in the middle of an attack. He only has a few attacks, but it might take some practice to understand what does what. Also, fantastic touch on making Z Saber's boss arena a locker room. A few hits and Z Saber goes down, when he summons the robot version of 20xd6 Trogdor, Mecha Trogador. Starting another boss fight, Mecha Trogador needs to be attacked in his eyes until they shut, and he exposes his crystal heart. Repeat that process a few times and he'll explode, triggering an escape sequence that isn't that hard to complete, and finally ending the game. Enjoy the cutscene that reveals the name of 20xd6 Marzipan, her new design, as well as a sequel bait that I hope isn't just a tease. So, I suppose it's recommendation time, as foolish as this might be to do now. Honestly, despite being a Homestar fan and assuming that everyone who wants to play this has already played it, the fundamental frustrations for non-fans and newcomers have to make this a caution plus. The humor might not be a taste for people who never really got into Homestar Runner, and the frustrating sections of the gameplay might not be worth the trouble for those who are only curious to try it in a tertiary way. Like if you're not a 20xd6 fan, or a Homestar fan, but you want to play a Mega Man clone. Fans, of course, obviously won't need to hear a go from me, especially if you caught the reference I just dropped in that last sentence. The fact that we got this at all is a testament to the fandom, so here's to hoping it's preserved or remastered in a way so we can all enjoy it again. <laughs>